Uh, well, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, virtual meeting on child lifers organized by the Howard League for Penal Reform. We have a great panel tonight. We have lawyers, uh, advocates, uh, and we have um, people with actual experience um, of the child lifer system. Um, and uh, they're each going to speak for about five minutes briefly. Um, just a bit of word of encouragement to join the Howard League um, uh, you, it's um, a, a modest subscription and gets you a long way. Uh, and the Howard League, of course, has done uh, immense work over the years for children in custody uh, and uh, incredibly valuable, both on the macro level, pressing for reform of the law uh, and also representing individual uh, children um, at parole hearings, adjudications and trying to um, uh, secure their rights. Just to say, this session is recorded uh, and there will be a chance for uh, discussion um, at the end. Um, I, I won't say any more myself other than that the continued practice of subjecting children to life sentences on a mandatory basis for murder is inhumane uh, and maybe still susceptible to legal challenge. And the system for review still um, leaves a lot to be desired. But if the government, with its present proposals, uh, uh, has its way, um, then it could be even worse and less flexibility, less reviews, and less opportunity for people who have been rehabilitated uh, to win their release uh, uh, early. So um, with that, uh, and without more ado, I just introduce um, Laura Jaynes, Dr. Laura Jaynes, who um, is the um, legal head um, of the Howard League. She um, has oversight of all the legal services, has immense experience in representing uh, a, a young uh, um, and child offenders um, uh, in parole system, um, in uh, adjudications, uh, and um, has worked as an advocate uh, for the rights of um, child lifers uh, for many years and was awarded the Solicitor of the Year by the um, Inspirational Women in Law Awards um, uh, uh, in 2019. So Laura, without more ado, can, can I introduce you to speak? Thank you very much, Edward. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, provide a short introduction um, from the Howard League's perspective before we hear from our other panelists. Child lifers, when I use that term, I often get a double take. And rightly so, of course, it is an anomaly, at least within the European Union. And during my time at the Howard League, which is getting on for over 15 years now, I have spent much of my time working with many children who have been sentenced to indeterminate sentences, helping them along with my team to navigate the system, work towards parole and beyond. And in that time span, of course, we've seen the infamous IPP or DPP as it is for children come and go. But of course, I'm still working with a number of young adults yet to even be released from that sentence or who have been recalled or who are struggling on life license. And the journey towards release for a young person on life sentence is, of course, complex and arduous. And we'll hear from Dan later about that. But as we'll hear from Mary in a moment, while the life sentence is more common in this jurisdiction than in almost all others that are nearby, it is still really rare for most professionals. And of course, that means they rarely encounter a young person in that situation and the various mechanisms that apply are therefore poorly understood for most of the characters involved. And of course, the pressure of lifelong liability to recall is just indescribable. A young adult on license, on life license with learning disabilities called me last week. He had been named, he had been shamed, he had been attacked in his local area. He was on the verge of homelessness and he just did not know where to turn for fear of recall, having already experienced that twice and really wanting to live a good life. Another young person that I worked with was sentenced to an IPP at the age of 15, and he struggled immensely in prison for several years. Eventually, he was transferred to hospital under the Mental Health Act, 
where it then became apparent that, of course, he had a functional IQ of 52. We appealed his sentence and it was substituted for a hospital order. And in the course of that appeal, his psychiatrist had said that the IPP hung over his head like the sword of Damocles. And that felt a little bit far-fetched at the time, but we were successful in the appeal and I've continued to work with him ever since. And what has been incredible has to, is to see how was the pressure of that sentence removed from him. He has flourished and he is now uh, having a successful and happy and positive life. So you can really see how that fear preys on the progress and chances of young people. And it's for that reason, of course, that at the Howard League, we're really concerned about the proposals in the new white paper. We've summarized them, or Mary has summarized them for you in our handout. And they propose to increase the minimum terms for 15 to 17 year olds uh, who are serving life sentences uh, who, when they're sentenced, not, not retrospectively, and also to reduce the scope for minimum term reviews, the chance, as we'll hear about later on, to have a progress check. Now, given the challenges faced by children in prison, it's really difficult to see how this increased uh, tariff um, in terms of the punishment can be consistent on any level with the principle of the welfare of the child or helping people to develop a healthy sense of responsibility and maturation. The precise nature of the proposed restrictions on the availability of these progress checks, the minimum term reviews, are unclear. But what does seem to be clear is that there seems to be a move towards reducing that inherent welfare and progress check for those convicted of murder as children. Taken together, these proposals will be costly and counterproductive. As we will hear from our colleagues tonight, the current system requires significant reform but with a view to prioritizing and harnessing hope for change over punishment. So now I'm really delighted to play a short recording of an interview uh, between myself, uh, Mary, and a young person we've worked with for many years, Dan, who is supported by our colleague Claire at the Howard League, who's going to tell us about his experience through the Life Centre. Hope is the sentence. Um, is that it should be promoting the process of maturation, the development of a sense of responsibility and the growth of a healthy adult personality and identity. How do you think your experience of your sentence fits with hearing that description of what it should be? I don't feel like the system actually is it's actually helping, helping in that way at all. It doesn't matter what lifestyle a child has come from, like finding something that they love that they can that they can build upon and grow from within themselves is much more powerful than any structure that you're ever going to create. I started reading a book in, in my own time and and that sort of made, and, and it was like, must have been about 50 words, even more that I didn't understand. So I wrote them all down and then I got a love for English and then that enabled me, which is surprising because I didn't even like English in the class. And, and then that enabled me to sort of communicate better through 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 my creative writing. And, and not only that, but that, that, at the age I was, I got so much sort of credit for it and 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 com and compliments. Mm -hmm. Now it, it sort of it, that that proves to you that if you feed positivity into a child or into someone, it will make them carry on and become good at something. So you you have to you have to find what they what they like or what they say they like and try and get them to push through it. When I, once I learned that, I learned social skills and I learned communicating. Still not the best at it, but that's. And how do you I'm think? Going. Do you think the system helped with that? Um, no, I think one book helped with that, and that was luck. For me, it it, it wasn't necessarily the, the courses because they were all very similar. Being able to mature, understand that like everyone's different, and trying to understand people, so it's hard to do that. If you're being judged all the time, it's hard to try and see other people's point of views and stuff. But once you so once you can do that, it, that sort of enables you to grow and understand actually the damage you cause as a child. Well, mm. you remember that very first time actually going out into the yeah. world again. So they, they don't teach you the life skills that you might need, how to pay bills, how to do housing, how to get on how, how to do this, how to do that. They don't teach you that sort of stuff for survival when you've come in the system that young. 
well, with the officer, I was a bit weird because I, I, I thought to myself, I don't want him to think that I'm not, I don't want him to write anything down that's going to stop me going home for the day. So you're always fighting that in your head, right? And when I came out, I remember I was walking down the street and I said, yeah, I want a chocolate eclair. So I went in there. As I walked in there, I see some people in there and I spun round and walked out. The officer was outside and I laughed to myself as I turned around. I went, what are you doing, you idiot? That's what I said to myself. And I walked out and he went, you all right? I went, yeah, just what I just... um." I just making sure that's what I wanted before I, uh, before I go order it. So I look back through the window and go, yeah, that's what I want. And I walk back in. <laughs> and then she goes to me, um, uh, what do you want? I said, can I get an eclair, please? She went, fresh cream or artificial cream? At this point, I wanted to shout and go, just anything, yeah? Please just let me get it and go, yeah? And then she go, and I go, anything? She goes, do you want me to eat for you as well? I was like, oh, it won't end. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I, I did, had no social skills whatsoever, right? And then, and then I went to give her the money for it. I had the change for it, but I'll give her a note. So you're not really socially, you know, I mean, you're not really like sharp with money or change or, or just just even interacting. And then, and so th- that was a bit of a thing. It's yeah. really overwhelming. Given yeah. everything that you've said today about what really helped you mature personally, yeah. what do you think it would have looked like to see something? So the structure would have, would have been, the structure would have been the same in in a sense of, so you have some, you have more one-to-one work with someone, an outside body, who, like some, some sort of support work. You have it in the community. Why can't you have it in there? Someone can come in and you can have that. Someone you could trust, not someone that goes, oh, we have to tell them if you say something, or you have to do this if you say something. Because then you're not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you nothing, or I'm not gonna trust you. So when you were sentenced, Dan, how much did you know about how your sentence works? When I got sentenced, I knew nothing at all regarding minimum term review. I didn't even know it existed. I heard through um, a prisoner saying, have I heard? And he and um, so I called a solicitor and asked. I think that was the first time I ever heard of it. They don't actually tell you. Do you think having the minimum term review to sort of work towards actually mm-hmm. helped you get on the courses so your solicitor could argue, look... Yeah, that that towards- did enable that to happen. I've, at that time, it felt very uncertain and, and like, like I was working... They told me I had to do the courses, but then told me I couldn't do them. So it was like, I, I thought I was going to be sort of lost in a system, if I'm being honest, at that, probably at that stage. I think for children, you have to give them something to work towards. But if you do have a midterm review, it lets them know where they are, where they are in their sentence, from, an, from the judge or from someone that's looking in. So they know, because otherwise all the opinions they're going to get is all going to be based on the people that are in the institution. And they're not the ones that actually make the decision, but they can write all the negative or put So you never know where you are. So it's good to have the mid tariff there, gives you something to work to work toward and let you know what stage you're at. And if you had one piece of advice for a young person starting out on a life yeah. sentence right now, what would it yeah. be? Contact the Howard League. <laughs> I think I was joking, isn't it? I'm being deadly serious. Thank you very much, um, um, Dan. Um, that was really um, inspiring and, 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 and um, informative. Um, and now Mary um, Franklin is, is now going to um, um, speak briefly. She's a trainee solicitor at the Howard League and a Justice First Fellow. Uh, she specialises in the rights of children and young persons. Uh, and she's working now on a project to create better information and guidance for young people and professionals um, serving the HMP detention service. Um, So Mary, go ahead. Thanks Ed. So yes, as part of my Justice First Fellowship, I get the opportunity to formulate and deliver a project that improves access to justice. My project aims to achieve better justice for young people who are serving a sentence of detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. We've heard Dan speak poignantly about his experience of the sentence, his reflections on what helped him to mature and notably, though certainly not unusually, the fact that he knew nothing about the opportunity he would get to have his minimum term reviewed. I want to talk about the particular vulnerabilities of this group, the problems that these young people face when trying to progress and what we want to see happen. Just a quick word about the sentence. It's fundamentally a welfare-based sentence. It's meant to foster a healthy adult personality, but prison doesn't do that for children. It's a hostile environment that's stunning. None more so than for teenagers, children who haven't, as Dan explained, even so much as bought a pastry from a bakery, never mind navigated what it means to have a healthy adult personality. 
the question central to the project then is how can that change for the small group of children who've been convicted of the most serious of crimes? So turning to the particular vulnerabilities, this is a group that present with a unique set of challenges and complexities. The sheer state of shock that children experience at the point of sentencing, the shattering of relationships, of losing all connections with the outside world and seeing that stretch as far as you can't even imagine because you haven't even been alive as many years as you're now to spend severed from everything that you knew. The total rupture in self-identity of being identified as a murderer and coming to terms with that conviction in the volatile environment of a children's prison. The significant life events that you're absent from due to imprisonment. The trauma of having taken a life, having been branded a murderer and being in a system, as Dana said, you don't have someone you trust that you can even begin to unpick that with. The young people that we speak to at the Howard Lee are often resigned, frustrated and without hope. But through our specialist legal work, we are able to identify some of the systemic problems that this group of young people face, where changes could result obviously not just in change for the young people, but also for society. Those healthy adult personalities which could be cultivated to enable young people to lead safe, fulfilling lives and release. So to talk just about a few of them, firstly, Laura already alluded to the lack of knowledge. This is a welfare-based sentence that no one really knows anything about. Dan had no idea about it. And in our experience, often professionals don't understand how it works. That opportunity, that's something to aim for that was so important to Dan. Children aren't told about it. And I'm sure many people here this evening will be aware of how it works. But as Laura said, it's just such a rare sentence that many youth justice professionals may find they never come into contact with a child serving it. And then there's the insufficient specialist provision and opportunities for that progression. There's only one dedicated LIFA unit, and that's at Weatherby. There's a lack of accredited courses to demonstrate risk reduction. There are pockets of good practice. I understand a while back Felton set up a designated LIFAs group, but the guidance really needs to be there to make most of this and build on it. Professionals need to have a really clear grasp of the legal framework, and also given the complexities of this group, any provision should really be psychologically informed. Then there's the disruption and the obstacles to progression, moving prison all the time, transferring to adult prison. How can you begin to track and evidence your pro unforeseen progress? And children convicted of murder will potentially be restricted status, the equivalent of category A of children. If it is designated restricted status, the opportunities for development and progression are constricted. Can't get any jobs, can't necessarily do the courses, enhance scrutiny of your social contacts, moving cell every few months. At Howard League, we're seeing more and more young people being designated restricted status. And it's quite absurd that the law, the young people who by law are entitled to be rewarded for their progression are by law prevented from demonstrating it. So what needs to happen? We think there needs to be really clear guidance, processes and provision in place if there's any chance that this sentence is going to serve its purpose. We've heard from Dan about his experiences of the sentence and the project is going to put the experience of young people at its centre. But ultimately no improvements can happen without the input and expertise of professionals who understand the landscape and the realities of the system. It is, after all, professionals who are the adults that are in a position to influence and bring about positive change in the lives of these young people. We want the project to be as wide reaching and collaborative as possible. So we'd really hope that professionals who are here this evening could share with us their ideas. What have you seen work? Where do you see an opportunity for change? And how can we make the welfare based sentence a reality? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, and uh, Mary will, will be able to answer the questions at the end of the session. Um, but can I um, move on to introduce um, Sheena Evelyn? Uh, uh, she Sheena is the mother of an, a young person sentenced to detention uh, at Her Majesty's pleasure at the young age of 14. Um, she is a, a working mother of three children, uh, and she is an active campaigner in the organization Jengba, the Joint Enterprise Campaign Group. Um, so, um, uh, Sheena, welcome and um, thank you very much for, for talking to us. Thank you. So, um, 
I'm going to have the privilege of asking Sheena a few questions uh, this evening. So Sheena, thank you so much, um, as Edward says, for being with us today. Um, you heard Mary describe what the sentence is supposed to be um, to promote maturation, a healthy identity, sense of responsibility. From your perspective as a, as a mum, do you see the sentence fulfilling that objective in any way? Definitely not. I have just listened to you, Marianne, then. Absolutely broke my heart listening to that and brought home the reality of the abuse the prison system does to these children, being locked behind doors. The most nurturing of progress can come from a mum and family in a, positive, in a positive setting, and it's not getting adhered to. Mothers aren't allowed to even simple things like hug your child and sit next to them. It's having a massive mental effect on the children. It's not being, it's not working. It's shown it's not working from, was it Lady Hale in the Smith judgment in 2006? We're in 2021 nearly now, and it's still not working. When are we going to wake up to this? It doesn't work. What's being implemented is failing miserably. These children are broken beyond belief locked up for 23 and a half hours a day in segregation. They're not even learning the basic skills, like Dan said, there's no people skills. They're now getting free vitamin D tablets because they're not getting sunlight. It's on the canteen sheets, actual free, because they're not getting any daylight. Well, so um, thank you for, for that, Sheena. Um, just sort of, looking into the detail then because um as we've heard the idea is to progress through the sentence um you're supposed to be able to um do courses and develop this sort of sense of identity through education charity work what do you see from a mother's point of view is the main blocks that children in particular experience in in making that kind of progress what are the main blocks well, education's dangled like a carrot on a stick to these children through their behaviour. If you don't behave, you won't go to education. And as you rightly pointed out, it's a volatile setting in there. It's a fight for survival. It's like dog eat dog in those situations. So getting to education is it's minimal. So how can we progress through that with no education? Some of these children can't even read and write. They're going in at 13 and 14 on life sentences and can't actually read and write. And they're at age 21, still can't read and write properly. So what type of education are they meant to do? And the prisons will slip a booklet under the door and that's meant to be education. And you heard uh, Dan talking about courses um what, what's been your experience in terms of access to the sort of ri risk reduction type courses i see in my son's case he's got severe adhd and learning difficulties on the outside he was classed as a disabled child he hasn't got the social skills to sit in a classroom environment of more than three people so he can't cope in a classroom scenario so how is he meant to progress in education when he can't sit in a classroom? Thank you. And then I, I think one of the things that's a huge issue in youth justice at the moment is uh, the very high number of young black boys in custody. David Lammy reported on it over three years ago now, and the proportion has increased. And I'm just interested really on your perspective, whether the colour of somebody's skin makes a difference to their ability to progress through the system, in your view? I would like to say no. I'm mixed race myself. My mum's white. My father's black. But unfortunately, it is a race thing. The predominantly black children, Asian children, that are put into the system. And it's failing miserably. Thank you. And then finally, just, just to... To finish up, I just wondered if you could just tell us 
a little bit about how how your experience has been as a mum trying to support a child serving a life sentence. Any mother with a child removed or taken away is going to suffer on a massive set scale, mentally, emotionally. It's not only affected me, it's affected the family, his younger siblings. And just interacting with his younger brother and sister, that's being taken away. It's a massive loss. It's heartbreak, like any mother with a child. And, and have you felt able to help and support your son as much as you'd like to? You've got to make numerous phone calls and it's potluck if you get through. It's minimal. You've just got to hope and pray. The likes of the Howards League, I will commend you on the work you do, do with young children because you are a vital link to the prisons because you can get through doors we can't basically as mums and you're there for that reassurance, for that contact. We can't just phone up and check on our children. Little things like dentist appointments and hospital appointments, we can't hold their hands. The shackled to beds, it's just barbaric. Thank you so much, Sheena. I'm sure there will be questions for you later on. I'll just pass back to Ed yeah. now. Yes, thank you very much, um, um, Sheena. I think yeah, you really brought home just how terrible this sentence is and, and what the problems are about getting any real rehabilitation uh, under it. Um, our next speaker is Seanine Lamb. Um, Seanine, who I first met. Our co-founder and the chief executive of um, Just for Kids Law, um, who has enormous experience in the representation of children in all sorts of aspects of their rights and the loss of their rights. Um, and she set up the Youth Justice Legal Center, which trains lawyers representing children. Um, and um, um, so uh, I just introduced Seanine. She's won countless awards uh, for her work, including the Shackleton Fellowship and the Young um, Global Leader Award and, uh, uh, and um, an Eisenhower Fellowship. But um, most of all, we're interested um, um, to hear to hear about her her, her incredibly important work. Um, so, Seanine, thank, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ed, and um, thank you for having me, uh, Sheena. It feels kind of try to follow on with the legal position after hearing your really powerful account of the impact but it also motivates and inspires um i think the lawyers in the room for the reasons why they keep going off and facing failure uh taking cases and losing um we took a case in a case on appeal in 2017 uh, out of liverpool um a joint enterprise conviction for murder where five teenage boys were uh, sentenced to um, detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. Um, we were very conscious that we were standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, it was 20 years since Ed had argued Venables and Thompson in the House of Lords and then on to the European Court of Human Rights. And we were really lucky to have Ed um, and Laura and the Howard League advising us on these arguments around the uh, life sentence approach. Um, unfortunately, Ed couldn't be there at the hearing, uh, but also I'm really excited to hear about Mary's project, the Justice First Fellowship, some one that I work a lot with, and I think the projects are extraordinary. And if you can raise the ability for people to seek the midterm reviews, then that's an extraordinary achievement in itself. So one of the arguments that Joel and Nathan, uh, who is a QC officer at Doughty Street, took in regards to this life sentence or the, the, the detention at Her Majesty's pleasure for the young boys in this case was that obviously children should be distinguished from adults and that the European Convention on Human Rights is a living instrument. Um, Strasbourg had not been unanimous in the case of, of V, Venables and Thompson, and in light of the worldwide developments in the approach to the sentencing of juveniles. Uh, he also brought to the court's attention the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, demanding that any sentence be as uh, short for the shortest appropriate amount of time. 
and also to the court's attention at that time, an advanced copy of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child's concluding observations on the UK, which recommended uh, that, that the UK abolish the mandatory imposition of life imprisonment for those under 18. We had also brought to the Court of Appeals attention evidence from overseas. The Juvenile Law Center in the US provided us with a statement and so did CRIN, uh, the Child Rights International Network, who'd done a review of the global situation. And I'm just gonna uh, flick to their evidence. So CRIN's evidence was that life imprisonment as a sentence for offences committed while under the age of 18 has been almost outlawed across the members of the Council of Europe. So I'm reading directly from the witness statement that was before the court. Uh, they conducted global research in 2014 and 2015, and they published a report on life sentences in the European Union. Since then, every country bar Cyprus and the UK has abolished life sentences for those under 18. The Secretary of State had objected and said that there were 45 out of 67 um, countries who maintained life sentence for children. And Krim pointed out that these are members of the Commonwealth and that the relevant legislation predates their independence. So that the prevalence of life sentence for children remains within the Commonwealth and is a lasting legacy of British criminal law. So well done us again for uh, spreading that across the, across the world. Um, we'd also had evidence from the Juvenile Law Centre of this, and, and all of us know that the Americas hardly consider progressive when it comes to sentencing de, uh, defendants or its criminal justice regime. However, what they said, the Juvenile Law Centre, is that in, in the last 15 years, or at the time 12 years, there had been rapid evolution in how children were treated in the criminal justice system, starting with the case of Roper versus Simmons in 2005, which, argued, which found that the death penalty was wrong for children. Graham versus Florida, life without parole for non-homicide cases was unlawful. Miller versus Alabama in 2012, banned life without parole altogether. And then in 2015, Montgomery versus Louisiana Anna offered retroactive sentencing hearings for all of those children who'd been sentenced to life without parole. And all of this, uh, all of these Supreme Court decisions in a fairly conservative environment have been decided on the evolving knowledge of adolescent brain development, uh, psychology, hormones, and peer uh, what people had learned about peer environments for children and young people. So the, their changes were really based on this neuroscience and adolescent development research, which we'd also presented to the Court of Appeal in, in the case um, that, that we took. Sadly, the Court of Appeal took a different view. Uh, we, took, uh, we tried to take the challenge up to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but we were told that we were time barred um, and that the six month period that had begun to run on the applicants convictions when they had been convicted of murder and not when their appeal had been found against them. Um, so uh, is there a glimmer of hope that we could take, that someone could take a challenge again? I do hope so. Um, Lyndon Harris in his criminal law review uh, study of this case of McGill and Hewitt, a 2018 criminal law review article, said that he believed that there was a glimmer of hope because the court stresses in the case that was lost that this submission must be seen in the context of the murder we have described, so in light of that particular fact, um, which is the possibility to indicate that there might be a case in the future involving a youth with more favourable facts in which it might be suitable to challenge the mandatory nature of the sentence of detention during Her Majesty's pleasure in relation to offenders who do not pose, pose a, such a risk to the or a risk to the public. But as the Court of Appeal noted, this would be a matter for the Supreme Court and ultimately Parliament should any legislative change be required. Um, so, I, I mean, I know that the white paper, it seems to be moving in the wrong direction, but perhaps it's a time to take the opportunity to show the UK Parliament how out of step they are with the rest of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much. And uh, Sean Ian, and there's a whole um, load of possibilities that you've raised. That I mean, I think really having heard Sheena and Dan and um, um, Laura and Mary, um, we've got to just fight against the sentence itself and certainly the mandatory imposition of it. And then the minimum terms um, re retain um, the, as much flexibility to reduce them if they're going to be there at all. But I suppose the worst thing is the indeterminacy of it um, and the fact that it can go on forever before you even get out. And then lifelong liability to recall. Um, and I think there might be a challenge. There might be a challenge we can bring to the fact that you can never get rid of a, a, a life sentence imposed as a juvenile, that, that, that at least that should be provision for it to terminate at some point so that you don't, for the rest of your life, remain liable to recall, um, which, of course, is, is the case with certain IPPs and with the, um, uh, the mental hospital things. You can, you can get an absolute discharge. You can, you can get rid of it in the end. Um, Anyway. Uh, and of course, the notification requirements, um, yeah. you know, that there had to, uh, that the, of course, the Supreme Court ruled in the JF case that uh, there had to be an opportunity to apply for those to be cancelled yeah. altogether. So yeah. this continuing duty review. We've got some questions in the chat, um, which yeah. uh, we can feed in and ask uh, our panel members to uh, respond to. I'll start uh, with one from Katarina Gunter, who asks, how can it ever be compatible with the welfare principle to give a child a minimum term, which is longer than the child is old at that time? Um, certainly, uh, we at the Howard League have, have spoken to children who are who've called, it up, called us up and said uh, that their minimum terms are older than they are, and they just don't seem to be able to comprehend that. I think actually, Edward, it'd be perhaps you might want to comment on that to, to start with and then maybe Sean in. Well, I think the truth is that it, it says in the um it says in the Children and Young Persons Act that the welfare of children shall be a primary consideration in their sentencing. And and uh, that is really inconsistent with these massive minimum terms. Um, we all we did try to challenge that um, in the um, Venables case, but they said there was nothing wrong with having a minimum term. But you could argue about the length of it. But I totally agree with the point that um, it, it really the the notion that sentencing of children should be in accordance with rehabilitation is there in all the international law uh, conventions, and it's in the English statute but we really don't follow it. And it's just lip service to it um, at the present. Um, and all, all we've really won over the years is first of all, the right for the sentence, the tariffs to be slightly shorter because your children, which isn't really the point, the whole tariff concept is, is alien to rehabilitation. Uh, and secondly, that there should be these reviews. They're very valuable and important that the sentence should be uh, as short as possible and that the um, sentence can be reviewed. But as you say, the idea of these massive tariffs is, is just inconsistent with, with looking, at, looking for the child's welfare. And it's inconsistent with the approach really throughout Europe. Thanks, Ed. Shonin, do you want to comment on that? Yes, thank you, Laura. And I think the thing that's really interesting in, in looking at these cases from a kind of a 20 year perspective is, is really looking at the socio-political environment as well, because what you see in the case that um, Ed argued in 97 in the, in the House of Lords uh, for Venables and Thompson is a clear understanding of our obligations uh, in kind of international human rights uh, uh, principles and very clear about what the European Convention requires but what we were seeing obviously in 2017 is is um, a court that's based in Brexit and aligning itself much more with the Commonwealth rather than with Europe and so alienating itself in some ways from the European neighbours uh, but I do think there is a lot to shame the UK about and that how regressive really we are um, and, and I think that that comes through the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, 
uh, which of course we've all we've we've signed up to. We've ratified. Wales is now integrating it into its domestic legislation. Scotland is looking to do the same. England kind of will be a stubborn outlier in the UK. Um, you know, with Scotland getting rid of the defence of reasonable chastisement, raising the age of criminal responsibility, we really do look like we are the old fashioned out of date, I don't know, patrician uh, part of the, of the UK. And I think that that's where the pressure might be best to come from in a parliamentary um, level. Thank, thank you, Seanine. Unless any other panellists want to come in on that question, there's um, a few practical questions coming through in the chat uh, and uh, one attendee has asked whether there is a maximum or minimum that the tariff can be uh, reduced by um, and perhaps I'll just uh, respond to that that I don't think there is any prescribed amount um, but generally uh, that well the most I've known it in, in reported judgments to be reduced by is about two years um, and generally um, it would uh, you know, about a year is, is what one can expect um, to get if you're lucky. Uh, we've also got another question in um, from Iwa asking how many life sentences are imposed on children each year. So um, I might pass over to Mary to answer that one. Thanks, Laura. Um, so the data um, isn't, we don't have a clear picture of the data. We've put in freedom of information requests to try and find out um, more information and, and fill this another knowledge gap that we have. We do know that in 2019, in September, the last time we have published data, there was 26 children who were serving mandatory life sentences. So it is a very small cohort, um, but I think we should have a bit more information once we get some responses to our freedom of information requests. There would be a lot of other people who were sentenced as children who are in the system still as adults. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, and we do have data. We have got some freedom of information at requests that, that you know, there are hundreds of, of people mm. who were sentenced as children still um, in the system. Um, and uh, the one of the great joys about the huge and wonderful range of participants attending um, the event tonight is that we have in the audience Simon Crichton, who has corrected me um, and I'm very grateful that apparently there is a judgment saying that the reduction shouldn't be more than two years. So, so, um, so in, in terms of the uh, reduction in terms of minimum term. Um, so, um, I, I, Ed, did you, is there any other issues that perhaps we want to uh, throw out there? Well, I, I suppose the, um, the, the reduction, the minimum term, I, I'm wondering that whether that saying you can only get two years off is, is a, a fettering of discretion, that might be challengeable. I, I mean, I, I think that the, um, the things that we can still work for is a challenge to the mandatory imposition of the sentence. Um, the um, need for, um, to retain the flexibility in it being reviewed and perhaps going for absolute discharges. I think we should bring a case with someone who has who has got out and been out and not reoffended for a long time, saying the time has come when it's inhuman. To, there's no penological, no justification for continuing the sentence. There should be a, a power in the English courts to to end it. That would obviously have to be taken to the European Court um, eventually. But I suppose we could go for a, a declaration of incompatibility here. Um, and then obviously we're going to have to fight against the um, government's proposals to increase um, the minimum terms um, for those between 15 and 17 to um, uh, fight against the idea that life should mean life for people under 18. I mean, that, that is a horrific uh, prospect. Um, and also to um, retain um, multiple reviews, um, not just one. Um, but those are really just things we can do as lawyers. Um, I think the, the, the fight for real rehabilitation is, is a, a broader political and social fight. 
Thank you. And uh, we also have now a question from uh, Caroline Willow, um, a fabulous uh, children's rights uh, campaigner, fresh from her victory in the Court of Appeal this week, uh, which uh, ruled the uh, government's uh, restriction on children's rights um, as a result of the pandemic to be unlawful. So congratulations to Caroline. She says, that Shawneen described developments in neuroscience and child psychology. What about understanding children's experience of time compared to adults and the tremendous human development which takes place across childhood? I wonder, Sheena, if you would like to comment on that to start with and then perhaps Shawneen can come in. So the question really is about um, looking at children's understanding of time and how that differs. I always think about how long those summer holidays used to seem, that six weeks, which now seems to fly by, and that massive development. Thanks, Sheena. Yeah, it massively differs. My child, when sentenced, asked what life meant. He was 14, sentenced to a tariff of 12 years, life sentence, joint enterprise, two years less than he'd been on this earth. He couldn't comprehend it. Subsequently, at the age of 15, he started hearing voices. Psychology reports said this was a direct effect of him being removed from his mum at such a young age. So it was borderline personality disorder, his way of coping from being removed from the family environment. It has a massive effect on children. You send your child to the bedroom for five minutes. It feels like five hours to them. They're locked in a bedroom. My son was scared of the dark before he went away. And now he's kept in solitary confinement for up to 23 and a half hours a day in a dark cell, getting washed in a sink, no shower. It has a massive, massive effect on them. And, and thank you for, for that, Sheena. And uh, Shawneen, do you want to come in on this issue of children's experience of time? Yeah, and uh, congratulations, Caroline, again on your case. Uh, I've read it twice already. Um, ju so just to say, yeah, I, obviously I totally agree. I, I think the, th the hard thing, the, the the judgment in this case was uh, was obviously a massive disappointment to me in the case I took because I felt like I presented all of the evidence that the court needed um, to make the right decision. But as we know, um, the courts are also political beings, and if they don't want to read or rely on certain parts of the evidence, they just don't um, mention that in the judgment. So. The thing is, how do we get the evidence to the court so that they are, um, so that they really consider it in in a, in that way? And of course, I think the thing we we are all conscious of time being very different for children and, and young people. Um, I am not aware of any science that shows that, and we were trying to present the science um, to the court, and and it just looking at the decision that the this US Supreme Court said in Graham that uh, these salient characteristics mean that it's difficult even for expert psychologists to differentiate between juvenile offenders who cry, whose crime reflects unfortunate yet transient immaturity and the rare juvenile offender whose crime reflects irreparable corruption. I mean, we of course have a difference of opinion even amongst the scientific community. Um, and I think we need to have a receptive court to present all of that evidence to. Thanks so much, Shawneen. I think that's really, um, really important. And I think we need to um, have better tools in the box to make sure that we can get that evidence out there and an, enough insight. And sometimes um, one of the things that I notice in, in my practice is that um, sometimes young people are engaging with mental health and and can form therapeutic relationships in custody but that doesn't always connect through into the paperwork that then actually goes towards what happens to them um irl um i'm just going to um in real life mary's teasing me um i'm just going to turn now to uh mary just to um pose a few more ideas and questions 
Yeah, I really wanted to ask Dan another question. I don't know if Dan's still there. Um, but obviously yeah. we've heard a lot from, hi Dan. Um, we've heard a lot from Sheena about all the obstacles, the terrible things, the difficulties that her son's faced. And obviously we heard you speak about your progression through the sentence. Given the project that I'm doing, I'd be really interested in hearing you talk a little bit about anything positive that you experienced. Mm -hmm. from through in, in what was positive in in from in my yeah. life or positive from the system positive from the system um not really no not not <laughs> anything positive that i mean some stuff there's some stuff within the system um is positive but it's more of the people that are in the environment that, that the that the prisoners or that, that make make it a positive environment because there's or negative environment so really there's nothing really positive the fact that you can go to education maybe but then you have all the other problems as as um as Sheena said earlier about you you have all the violence and everything and some so some people can't go to educate or they have educational problems and they can't cater to everyone's needs so there's nothing so there's not all it's not always positive even if on the surface they go well we're running this program but it also has other complications that they need to sort out but so mm. positive gym maybe the gym sometimes or that's rare to get to so everything that's positive is still hard to get or have or do or so so that 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 it that's that that's it really for that well, thank you. And as somebody has just said in the chat, Dan, your hesitation there speaks volumes. Just want to um, read out a message from uh, Susie Hulley, who's um, one of the authors of the brilliant um, book on young adult imprisonment, which was a really uh, comprehensive study and I think is going to be subject to a follow up study of um, over 100 uh, young adults sentenced to life imprisonment. And she says, um, that in uh, their study of men and women serving life um, that they received when they were 25 or younger, we found that those who are currently aged 18 to 25 years old, so not as young as uh, children, um, the temporal pains of imprisonment were reported as more severe than those who were older when they were interviewed. So feeling that your life is being wasted, feeling that you're losing the best years of your life, feeling that the length of your sentence is unfair, and thinking about the amount of time you might have to, to serve. So thank you very much, Susie, for that um, long perspective there. Um, so shall I pass to uh, Edward, do you want to raise any? Well, uh, well, uh, only I, I, I mean, I suppose from, from the point of view of us as lawyers and from the point of view of, of, of Parliament and trying to look at reform, the what we've really heard today is just the sheer harm that is done by these sentences uh and that i think is to some extent irre irremediable harm and that's why the sentences need to know just how much harm it does do to very very young children who who's offending um well can't it can't be described as fully their fault um, uh, the may, uh, um, so I think just really all, all that we've heard um, from Dan, from Sheena, and from from, from um, um, also from Seanine and, and Mary brings that home. The only other thing I would say, I mean, and hearing from Dan is that there is the other side of it, which is that the human spirit is incredibly resilient, and that if we could offer real rehabilitation and real um, uh, opportunities for reading and, as, as, as he said, or, or a stimulus, um, then this, this very damaging sentence, I mean, there is, some, there is at least some, some hope that people can rebuild their lives. And I think, I mean, I, I, you know, I've obviously had the horrible experience of um, John Venable's frequent relapses. Um, but equally, I think it is extraordinary how people do 
keep coming back and keep changing and keep um, um, having another go at life, if I can put it in that way. Uh, I, I, I mean, so, and I thought, thought that, you know, it's great to hear just from Dan that, well, that how, how important a thing like a book is. Um, and uh, after all, we did have the thing where they were trying to ration books in prison and stop, you know, cut down education programs. I mean, the, the, the other thing is, it, it's incredible is how people have survived the, um, the lockdown. I mean, it, it, you know, I mean, I, I, most of us would go, well, would go mad if, if we're put in a single cell for, um, for the length of time that people are, are being put in it. So, you know, it, it, it is extraordinary how, how, people, how people do survive and kind of it's almost, uh, I'm not, <laughs> I, I suppose we really need to study that too. What, what is it that can enable people to survive and, 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 and recover? Um, yeah. So, and I think on, on, on that note, Ed, I think one of the other things that's come through in the uh, Q&A from uh, Ali Sykes from the uh, Secure Accommodation Network asked whether there's a view on how secure stairs model that's being rolled out across uh, the sector may help um, to support our young people. So that's a, a health and well-being model um, that is being rolled out. and. Um, I suppose I'm probably best placed to, to answer that um, at this stage, which is that I think in principle, it's a good idea, but I think what we've heard tonight is some of the harm that's caused um, is by virtue of the fact of imprisonment. And one thing that really I find most difficult when I'm doing a parole hearing for, usually it's by then a young adult, but someone who's been sentenced as a child, is how to get over the fact that they have just missed out on things they will never regain. They haven't had um, that sort of first romantic experience as a teenager, and they will never have that. And they come out as, uh, as adults, looking like adults, but without any of the experiences that go before it. So when they go to open conditions and they are meeting older people who are reintegrating and re-familiarizing themselves with society, for them, they're doing things for the first time. First relationship, first time opening a bank account, first time uh, going to buy a, a profiterol or a Claire. <laughs> I mean, so, um, so I think that while the secure stairs model is obviously a step in the right direction, I think it just can't and perhaps could help with the strength of spirit that Edward talks about and helping people to uh, maintain hope and recognize their resilience. And I think recognizing young people's resilience in custody is something we don't hear very much about. I'm not sure it's a, a complete um, answer. Um, we're at uh, 1829 and um, I just, uh, as we're due to finish, I'm going to ask each panel member uh, an opportunity just to say one last uh, message uh, to end with. And then after that, we will uh, play out and we will listen. Of course, this week uh, marks uh, the anniversary of the loss of Jack and Saskia. And we will be playing out to Roscoe's tune, um, which is uh, a really incredible uh, piece. So if I could ask uh, Sheena to give us uh, a final message. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. I think the bigger picture comes into question that why are our children being incarcerated in the beginning? What are we doing to prevent children from receiving any type of custodial sentence? The book shouldn't stop with yourselves. It's a bigger picture. We shouldn't be having children even entering the system. So where are we failing? And Shawnee. Thanks, Laura. Um, well, I've been, as usual, <laughs> reminded of why we all do this work um, by Sheena and Dan. And, you know, the real, the real motivation to keep on doing it, because even if there are small numbers, um, we need to make that this change happen. And it reminds me of the Man Mandela quote 
uh, that says there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which, which it treats its children. Um, and I think that England's soul is not looking great. Dan. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? You can hear me all. Hi. How embarrassing. Yeah, we can hear um, <laughs> I, I feel, yeah, I can hear, that's fine. I feel like, I feel like what you have to do, you have to look at, you have to look at the system, but how it's run, but you also have to, because the whole system runs off something general, general, and you can't deal with children or as a general, because there's no child that's the same. So when you start realizing that and you work and you, and you try and chip away, that's as soon as they do that, they realize. But I don't, I don't ask me where where you can start. You just got to start and just believe and hope that it will get better. I suppose. Thank you, Mary. I think I just want to remind people that after everything we've heard tonight from Sheena, from Dan, and thinking about how the system is at the moment, and just remind people to get in touch and let us know if they have ideas that they can feed into our project. And Ed. For what I, well, I think we need to really keep pushing for fundamental legislative change to change the laws that, that uh, mandate HMP detention and um, that's, uh, that is the key in the end. Um, we've obviously got as lawyers to keep challenging the human rights dimension of that, what, why it's wrong, but, but we, we, we do need to try and persuade Parliament to change the law. Um, and, um, and that is right that it's a wider political agenda that, that, that's necessary in the end. Thank you. And now, thank you all so much for attending. Do keep in touch, do keep on doing the work that you're doing. And thank you. We'll now listen to Roska's tune. Are you doing all right, yeah? Yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm doing great, Dad. Everything's good. Yes. Yeah. And Look, Carol, all right? Carol's fine. So I'm going to get back to work, Dad. And then I'll, call, I'll give you a call later on tonight. And just Cheers. Cheers, a... Roska. All right, no problem. Say hi to Mum. Say my love to everyone. All right. Sweet day. All right. Bye bye. Look, on the road I was a YGB. See, mum saw a king that saw an IC3. The judge sat me down and gave me IPP. Told me do eight years and you might be free. But if I ever told you about the things that I've seen, all the place that I've been, by His grace I'm clean. All this pain in my heart, more time I can't sleep, I can't breathe. Cut the pain runs deep. Let's take it back to the start. I remember when I got inducted into the class. I got nervous when they told me that these people smart. Cambridge Student Centre all on my path. There was one in particular, he kept coming back. He was a Cambridge grad and his name was Jack. And Jack's eyes never saw white or black. He saw a fell system and hell fighting back. From parole knockbacks all the way to probation. Kept me educated, never broke communication from the inside. Gave me outside motivation. Told me keep faith because one day I'll build a nation. They took Jack from my heart, now I'm out here alone. Trapped in the dark, out in the cold, doing laps round the park. Running is my therapy, I'm wrapped by the past. The good die young and you're the proof of that saying. I can feel your presence in the booth when I'm slaying. Your kid will try to say you got them all this from above. But like that guy said, you ain't no Muslim, bro. Huh? You put me on stage with Santan Dave at the funeral. Me and your family pray. I see tears in your mum's eyes, I wipe them away. You brought me to watch a cry, this life is a shame. Man to man, Jack, you done a lot for me. Words of wisdom, invested in properties. You said do music and handle it properly. Give thanks for your life and your honesty. What you say, maybe forgot what you did, maybe forgot. But the way Jack made people feel will never be forgotten. And you know what just is? It's that Jack just wanted justice. He was fair, he was funny, he was kind. He could empathize with everyone in mind. What Jack did in his 25 years takes a whole lifetime to come anywhere near. A fighter, compassionate, strong, still confusing, believing you're gone. What Jack did in life 
we now continue burn with his passion fight with every sinew he'd stand up too knowing black lives matter such inequality fat cats get fatter the changes jack wanted now happening fast his name is the future and a bit in the past he lives on strong with the lessons he taught he lives on strong in every thought in every thought